Hey everyone, welcome back to Add to Your Faith Ministry Synoptic Gospel Study. I'm Elizabeth Lenu Bardhan, and today we are going to be starting a section of our synoptics that is just in the book of John. Um, the stories that are unique to John that um, follow Jesus feeding the 5,000. So um, that's where we're going to be. Jesus has just fed the 5,000 and has crossed over to the other side. And so we're backing up to that point in the others and starting with new stories that are only in John from there. So looking at John chapter 6, starting in verse 22, the lengthy passage. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Now, I'm going to, I think I'm going to do this passage in sections because that way I don't miss anything. So what has happened is Jesus fed the 5,000 and in John, the, the story order, Jesus feeds the 5,000 and then after he walks on the water to the boat. And then after that, we have this passage that the people who had been there for the feeding of the 5,000, they see that, that the disciples left, but Jesus didn't leave in a boat. They didn't know that he walked on water, it seems. Um, so they took the boat, that was Jesus's boat, and took themselves to the other side in order to be able to try to find Jesus. Okay, verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Okay, so stopping there for a moment. So the, the people come and they ask Jesus, how did you get here? Well, really, when did you get here? Um, because they took his boat. And Jesus didn't deal with that. He did not answer the question that they were asking. Instead, he dealt with their heart issue, was that they were there just for the food. Um, and in that, they weren't there to experience another miracle of food. They just wanted the food that he could provide. Um, it was probably very delicious, and it was miraculous food. Um, so anyway, so Jesus is saying, don't do that. Don't labor for the food that perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the, the God the Father has set a seal. So Jesus tells them, like, look, I know you're here just for the food, but I want you to understand that there's a pointlessness to life if you just work for food. Uh, you, instead, your effort, your labor should be focusing on understanding and getting the food that endures to eternal life, which comes from the Messiah, from the Son of Man, where God has set his seal. So he's identifying himself as the Messiah who can provide this food to eternal life. Okay, so let's keep reading. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Now, um, it's interesting because what Jesus said is, do not labor for the food that perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Okay, so he said, don't labor for food, but... You know, make your effort to understand and get the food of eternal life. But their response was, what must we do to be doing the works of God? So Jesus answered that and said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So instead of giving them works that they could do, they're like, oh, okay, we're supposed to be laboring for eternal food. So how do we do good works? And Jesus is like, no, what God wants you to labor at is knowing the Messiah. So this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. Um, so Jesus takes out works and points it back to belief. And so they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Um, I know that when we see these kind of passages where you're just like, what? Um, that we do the same things to God. We just don't see it in black and white the way we can see their thoughts and their words and their interactions with Jesus in these passages. And I think part of the reason we often respond to silly things that happen um, the way people talk to God throughout scripture 
um, I always just find it irritating. And like, you know, probably it's because deep in my heart, I know I do the same things and I'm actually irritated at myself, <laughs> but it's, it's something to be aware of that the way our minds work in our sinful nature, uh, we can be completely misled to understand the wrong thing, put our confidence in the wrong thing to miss the right thing completely. So Jesus is saying, you're only here for the food, but you need to understand that the real food that you can have is in me, in the Messiah that lasts forever and you won't get hungry again. And they're like, so what work do we do? And Jesus is like, you know, you need to believe. And so then their response is, well, what work have you done that we can believe in you? Now, remember, who are these people? These are the ones that Jesus just miraculously fed the group of 5,000 with five loaves of bread. And we're not talking sandwich loaves, like buns, and two little bitty tiny fish. Obviously, they saw a massive, huge sign. But watch what they say here. What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now, this is said in a challenge. And yet, literally, Jesus just gave them bread from heaven. Like real bread that he miraculously gave them. Um, I, I find it so amazing how blind we are in our sinfulness. They didn't even hear themselves. I mean, they, they're making the analogy of bread and manna. Uh, and saying, that's what our fathers did. And so you should do it again. Maybe that's what they wanted is they wanted more food. That's why Jesus said they were there. So they were trying to coax him or convince him to make more spiritual. Well, not spiritual. They wanted the real stuff, real food. So what does Jesus say? Jesus said to them, we're in verse 32. Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. Obviously, he means himself. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. They're still talking about eating. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Let's let's look at those before we go to that next part. So Jesus is saying, I am that bread. You know, like, first he tells them, you're only here for the food, but understand, there's better food than physical food. You need to be focusing on that. So then they're like, how do we get it? What work do we do? And Jesus is like, you need to believe. Okay, well, why would we believe in you? What miraculous science have you done other than, you know, that huge miracle we saw yesterday? But yeah, other than that, like... What can you do to prove yourself? Because Moses, he gave them manna every single day. And Jesus was like, no, Moses did not give them bread. God is the one who sent the bread. And I am that bread. Um, he, he's built them in their blindness. He has to coax them and build them to a point of understanding. And in our blindness, I think it's a similar thing that happens. Is that as truth is revealed to us, sometimes we are not able to understand it or receive it at that time. We only can understand chunks of it or portions of it. And so God has to give it a little bit more information. And then we argue and something human and very sinful. It's like, ugh. and then he gives us a little bit more truth. And as our hermeneutic grid, like the way we interpret scripture is filtering everything we're hearing from God. We have to be very careful to make sure that what we are hearing is what he is saying. They were not hearing him. Jesus is presenting the fact that he can offer them eternal life. They need to believe in him. He's already performed the signs. He's saying the right words, but they are not hearing him. I was thinking today about how um, a problem in Christianity in different countries is the culture provides the hermeneutic. Now, again, a hermeneutic means a grid. It is the crisscross lines um, of our brains, the things that make us think the way we do. Each line can be a different thing, like your education, your racial background, your church denomination, your version of your Bible, your, what else, your age, um, the actual culture that you're living in, like what worldly culture are you influenced by, the other things that help shape the way you think, um, like 
your friends, um, as well as things like Facebook and Instagram and any kind of social media are building the way you think about the world, the way you see all the little snippets of things that you read all day long. Those are building how you view the world and how you think, um, as well as other aspects that are deeper, again, like the way family has developed you, the way your church has developed, the way trauma develops, like each thing causes a person to filter what they hear and understand it based on that grid. And it's very, very hard to see truth outside the way your brain processes it, mm, which is frustrating um, because we usually don't know that we are processing the information incorrectly. So like these people, Jesus might be saying directly something to us that is true. And what we're hearing is, so you're going to give me bread, right? Where's the, where's the bread? I want the Moses style every day. My meals are now set. Bread, please. And Jesus is speaking clearly a gospel message and they are hearing food. Meet my needs. Um, now this is true in all aspects of life. Your hermeneutic is constantly working to everything you filter. Uh, but especially when you go to church and you're listening to a sermon or you're reading the Bible, as these things are coming into your mind, sometimes instead of hearing them, they're just going into those little boxes of, well, okay, I hear what they're saying, but uh, from my family perspective, that means this. And I hear what you're saying, but from a culture perspective, that means this, etc. And so then our brain just kind of shifts the information into how we want to believe it uh, subconsciously. And then we're like, yeah, okay, I'm not convicted of my sin. I'm doing fine. Just, um, and we can see that so clearly happening in scripture through these people, but we need to understand that that's what happens within our own brains. So, um, as I said, every culture has a different way that this looks and how it affects Christianity. Um, and it can become really interesting as a missionary going from different countries and seeing those cultural contextualizations is what it's called. So like the way that a culture takes the gospel, takes scripture, takes Christian truth, um, denominational practice, and then changes it and twists it into that culture so that uh, it meshes in the place that it's in. And contextualization doesn't always mean bad, like, um, but it often means a slight twisting or misunderstanding to fit the culture rather than the culture changing to fit scripture, which is what we want to happen. A biblical culture, meaning that the church and the Christians are not changing truth to fit their cultural understandings, but instead are changing the culture to fit the Bible. And that's what we see. Jesus is about to talk about, you know, there are those who the father are sending that they are going to stay with me. And then there's those who are not going to get it. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the background they're coming from, which we're going to talk to about in a minute. But just to kind of give some examples, um, in America, which is when I'll use because I am American, so therefore if I talk about America, it is not condescending um, or judgmental. If I talk about a different culture, then that can be taken as offensive because it's not actually my culture. So I will use America. Um, in America, we have issues um, that stem from a history of rebellion. America was founded um, by deists, please don't misunderstand and think they were Christian, um, by the deist founders um, who established a um, government system in rebellion to England, right? Uh, the whole war happened, killed a bunch of people, and we created a country that was based on what we said was good. Um, and that was things like complete independence from all authority, um, no one can tell me what to do, you know, hmm. how do I, <laughs> I get frustrated with this part of American culture because the way it affects Christians, um, things like what is a good character quality? What makes a good person if they're American is patriotic. They need to support the country because it's God's country. Um, apparently God doesn't like the rest of the earth that he made. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of issues there that frustrate me a lot because I see in Christianity what happens is the testimony of Christ is twisted and messed up um, because people are so bound to cultural understanding of the reality that they don't challenge it. Um, rebellion is wrong. Jesus told us to submit to our authorities and to pray for them. Uh, but what happens instead is the sense of independence is as a selfish, prideful, arrogant person, I have the right to say what 
I'm going to do, and I don't care who it hurts, is sometimes what happens. Now, that doesn't happen for every American. That is not always how it's contextualized. But you see a pattern, especially in the last couple of years through the Trump era and now the COVID issues of people saying, I'm an American, which means I have the individual right to do what I want for me and no one can tell me any different. So there's no sense of submission or respect of authority. There's a lot of rebellion and a lot of arrogance. Um, because that means I can make the judgment that my authority is definitely wrong, throw them off, do it again. Um, and so you have a lot of this coming out during these time periods in history where the church needs to say, are we responding to these issues in a way that is scriptural or are we responding to the issues in a way that is cultural? And... You know, if your church is one that would get angry if you stopped singing patriotic songs, but they don't care if you don't sing worship songs, um, then you have a problem. If you have people that will only fight you, if they only get passionate, if you're talking about the Constitution of the United States, but they don't get passionate about scripture, if they're only passionate about individual rights, but they don't care about loving their neighbors, then that's examples of how that aspect of American culture is contextualized wrong in the church. So what can someone do? Like if they're thinking from those mindsets and they realize how I'm seeing the world and how I'm behaving is culturally incorrect, scripturally. I'm behaving culturally. I'm not behaving scripturally. So what do you do? One, you need to ask God to open your eyes to see and to not be blind. Um, our cultures blind us to what's right and wrong from a scriptural point of view to where we just don't even see it. Um, versus like, you know, submit to your authority and pray for them when that was being preached by Paul to Christians who were being skinned to become a lamp for Rome, you know, um, that's, and they also had a constitution and the rights, uh, as Romans, which Paul did use, and he used those rights and he fought for them. He worked within the government in a submissive way. He accepted the punishment that came with his saying, you know, you're going to do this. If that puts me in jail, you're going to still treat me as a Roman citizen. Like Paul worked within the structure of the government in a respectful way that it was submissive, but yet also spoke out for what was right and wrong from his, you know, God-given perspective. So there are ways to challenge government. There's ways to do it. We still have to be submissive. We can't just be like, I'm going to take my gun out and just shoot them all, you know, militia. Um, so anyway, we need to ask God to change us so that we don't misread a situation from a historically consistent cultural background instead of a scripturally changed mind. Um, asking God to give us eyes to see how we're thinking and how we're responding, eyes to see scripture so that we actually understand what God is saying rather than interpreting it based on our, her our hermeneutic. Also, we need to ask that God softens our hearts and removes any cultural sin like rebellion from authority, lack of submission, pride, arrogance, idolatry, like anything that is culturally accepted as normal, um, that everybody in a pattern of a group of their Facebook friends or whatever are repeating that same thing over and over. So everyone thinks it's the right thing because it's the only thing they see that they would ask God to open their eyes and their hearts and soften their spirits so that they can recognize what God calls sin instead of just what everybody else calls right. Um, these people were standing in front of the Messiah saying, I need you to meet my needs the way I want you to meet my needs. And historically and culturally, we understand that that meant the manna gift so that every day our food was provided. We didn't have to work for it. It was just given. That's our cultural expectation from our history. And so that's what we want from you. And um, their culture was really hurting them because they are rejecting belief in the Messiah and asking for a cultural expectation. And if you listen to your prayers, would you say you can find scripture that matches what you're praying? That there are promises of God that are being used in correct context that match how you're praying? Or are they things that just match what other people are saying on things like Instagram or Facebook or your church or your community or whatever. Uh, if you're repeating people and their ideas and their slogans and their passion against something, but you're not actually 
repeating or quoting scripture, then there's an issue in your prayer life. And you need to acknowledge that, that you do have a blindness and a deafness towards your own culture and to ask God to open that up. And, and everyone has that. This is not a judgmental speech. Um, not meant to be. Everyone has cultural norms that they have established throughout their history, through their parents, through their culture. Um, that is kind of a part of a collective memory. It's what everyone is taught. It's what's in the history books. It's what in whatever. And this pattern of behavior is accepted as normal without any challenge from a Christian perspective who say, wait, is this okay? Is this kind of violence right with God? Is this kind of rebellion right with God? Is this kind of rejection of principles or guidance um, the actual way God wants me to go? Um, am I being like Paul who's saying this is the right way to work within the government and to challenge something? Or am I being like a rebel who's saying I don't care if it's the right way or not. This is how we do it because we're American. Uh, or whatever culture you're coming from. Every culture has their own issues of the way they misinterpret scripture and ignore cultural problems while still claiming to truly believe in scripture and to claim it as their own every single culture so whoever you are watching today what this all applies to all of us that we have to constantly ask god to wash our minds with his word and to cleanse our hearts from all of the misunderstandings and wrong beliefs that have built up in our hearts um, that we don't even know are there or we've never even thought that might need to be challenged and say, okay, God, in my life, what about the way I'm living, the way I'm thinking, the way I'm worshiping, the way I'm reading scripture, the way I'm handling issues and problems in the world around me? What is culturally driven and what is scripturally driven? And of course, you can't do that unless you know the scriptures, right? Like, but these people, they were quoting scripture. They were dealing with what they understood from a historical and cultural perspective. Um, but they had it wrong. They thought Moses was the one who gave it, but it was actually God. And in that misunderstanding, the leader gives it versus we're following God was a whole, was enough to make them miss the Messiah. And so Jesus is trying to, everything they're saying, he's correcting and shifting their mindsets to get back to what is right. But do they hear it or not? Let's keep reading. Okay, so... Um, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I, I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. All right, so Jesus brings this beautiful declaration of a fulfillment of the gospel that he has been sent to earth to fulfill the will of God, which is to provide salvation for man. And he's not going to lose anybody. He's going to bring everybody into eternal life at the last day. Now, he makes this statement that all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And that's what I'm talking about, this cultural thing, the Jews who were able to hear Jesus and the Jews who were not able to hear Jesus. Now, this does cause some people to have some... Um, theology that kind of spirals and builds in the wrong direction. So let's look at um, the second section before we talk about it and make sure that we really understand. Uh, so the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Let me read that part one more time because it's so important. Jesus answered, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God, who is Jesus. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. 
This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever." Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Okay, so there are some passages in scripture that I kind of dread dealing with. Um, with lost people. When I was working at the university, my coworkers were mostly non-Christian. There was two, I think, that were professing like evangelical Christians. Um, if, if two, at least one. Yeah, no, two. There was two. Anyway, whatever. Um, very few. <laughs> and I had uh, an office of like 20, 22 men that I was the only female and one of the only Christians. And so I got a lot of just attack because of passages like this that the atheists and the agnostics and just the Bible haters hated. Um, they love to bring up the slavery passages and be like, see, your God loves slavery and the war passages and see like God authorizes all this destruction. And then like this, like your God's a vampire. He wants you to drink his blood and eat his flesh like a zombie. I mean, all of these like weird, fun, fun, you know, opportunities to try not to argue, but present the gospel. But it was kind of oppressive and difficult at times. So when I, when I see this and think, woo, I would know they, if they heard this passage, the immediate response would be zombie vampire. Jesus saying, eat my flesh and drink my blood. So in reality, what is it that Jesus is saying in this um, passage? And think about how you would have felt if Jesus was the preacher at, the, at your synagogue that day. If Jesus walked into church and he preached this. Okay, everybody, you had the bread. You're wanting more. Let me explain. You don't need earthly bread. You need eternal bread. And this eternal bread is going to give you life forever. You're never going to get hungry again. They're like, yes, amen. He's like, so you need to understand that you have to believe in me as the Messiah. He didn't use those words Messiah, but that was the implication that was sent from heaven, that he was sent from the Father. Um, that's why they got mad. They're like, he's saying he's the bread from heaven. He's Joseph and Mary's son. What's going on? Um, so it was an obvious implication of messiahship. So he's like, okay. They're like, all right, you got to believe. And he's like, and you're going to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And the disciples are like, whoa, that's rough. That's a really hard saying. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, what does it mean? Jesus said that that saying was one that helped divide between those who are coming from the Father and those who were not. Um, I think there's several levels here. One is that the Jewish people at this time were coming from an Old Testament perspective to a New Testament perspective. They had been sacrificing lambs on the altar for their sins, rolling forward until the time the Messiah would come. They were 
Some of them were true God followers. They had faith in God. Because of that faith, they were obeying the sacrificial system, waiting on the Messiah to come, waiting on that moment that Jesus would start his ministry so that they could believe in him. Those are the ones that God is sending. Then you have the other group who are religious Jews, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who made up all those rules that we've talked about, and they added to people burdens that no one, they, they themselves wouldn't even do. And it was about ritualistic religion. You can only pick up so many sticks on a day. You can only walk so many steps. You can, if you you know, get unclean in some way, here's the real difficult way to be able to get clean, or you cannot come back to church for this amount of time, uh, much more even than what the original law had given, if I understand that part. Things like Jesus criticized them that you grow herbs and you will measure and give a percentage of these little spices and herbs, but yet their heart was not given to God. So those are the ones that cannot recognize Jesus as Messiah because they were not looking for a Messiah. The ones who've been in faith, waiting, believing, serving God, when Jesus came, they saw his works. They were able to understand within their hermeneutic that this is the Christ. This is who we've been looking for. We understand the prophecies. We know what's going on. We're waiting on him. And the ones who have been doing this ritual of I can do enough work to earn merit with God, that's their response. When Jesus is saying you can have eternal bread, they're like, what do I need to do? Tell me what I need to do. And the rich young ruler, what must I do to be saved? That was their perspective. They had been living this religion of self-righteousness. And Jesus comes and says, no, you need to believe in me. You need to eat my flesh and you need to drink my blood. This complete absorbing of who he is, complete um, abiding in his existence, um, that there is nothing in the flesh that does me any good, he says. It's only spiritual. And the words he is speaking are spiritual. So what does he mean? He doesn't literally mean his physical flesh. He says there's no good in it. It's the spiritual flesh, the spiritual bread of life and water, water of life. Like, what was that word? <laughs> so in that, Jesus is making it clear that we are needing to completely abide and absorb him spiritually, him being a part of who we are. That's nothing about my own works or my own merit that the other group was doing. Now, um, also, this points to how we understand the practice of the Lord's Supper. Up to this time, the Passover had been done once a year. Um, again, it was looking forward to that atonement lamb and that way that the Messiah was going to come and it was in reminder of what God had done in the Exodus and using the blood on the post to spare his people from the death angel. I mean, there was so much history and culture and future belief all wrapped into that. And when Jesus died, he died during Passover, right? He was the Passover lamb. He is the Passover lamb. And so that feast stopped with him because it was waiting on him to come. But it was changed at that night in the upper room when he had um, the Passover with his disciples. Then he made those statements that every time you eat this bread or drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Well, the cup he was drinking was a cup of salvation. It was the last of four or five cups. I can't remember how many in the Passover celebration. So that cup of salvation that is a part of the Passover, the thing that they were waiting on, now is what we practice in communion, in the Lord's Supper in church, um, which then, of course, Paul gives us a lot more information on how to do that correctly in the New Testament. So in eating the bread and drinking the vine, the combination of Jesus' blood represented and the bread between the juice and the bread representing the blood the body and blood of Jesus, that when we eat those things, we are taking spiritually into us this mentality of abiding in Christ and him abiding in us. And we're not supposed to do that with any unconfessed sin, with any rebellion in our hearts, with anything that would separate us from God, because it's a ceremony that's about intimacy and being completely connected to Christ. And that's what he's talking about here. But he's like, the only people who are going to be able to understand it are the ones who are already being sent from God. They're already in faith and they're already looking for the Messiah. Now, after this time period, once it was divided that the Jews who were going to come into what is now the church, they were going to leave the synagogue and then the other group was going to stay 
Jews, I mean, they're all Jews racially, what's it called? Judaism. They're going to stay in Judaism, whereas the new group would become Christians. And then as they evangelize the world, those who were neither, were not in any way connected to the Father, were the new converts to Christianity. So, um, when Jesus presented himself as the bread of life, he first had to deal with the cultural issues, the context of the hermeneutic of the people he was speaking to, as they argued and tried to bring up their own works and their own needs being met the way they wanted to be met from their expectations culturally and historically. As Jesus is dealing with those things, he's presenting the gospel of what it means to truly have the body and blood of Christ be a part of our spiritual being. And that is just such a beautiful and amazing um, passage. I hope that um, it has challenged you today to think about these things. Are you reading scripture through the power of the spirit with and asking the questions like, is what I'm believing right? Do I have anything in my mind that is from a cultural perspective that is not godly? Do I have anything in my practice of life or culture that is opposite of Christianity, but it's never been challenged by anyone within my culture. These are questions that we need to ask. If the Jews have been asking questions about, wait, are we right? Is this the right cultural expectation? Is this what we should be looking for? Then that act of faith of responding to Christ in this way could have been something that might have brought them to understand and see who he was. Um, but they were trapped in their culture and in their religion, which that hardness of heart that comes from sin, um, and repeating sin and refusing to repent of it is something that's very hard to deal with, especially in religious people, because they have religion, so they feel comfortable that what they're saying and doing is okay, but in reality, it's not. And we have to be very careful to make sure that our life is a life of faith that matches scripture, no matter what culture we're in, and that we've learned to challenge to think, not just from the ways we were programmed to think by our families, our educators, our churches, our cultures, our news medias, our social medias, etc., but that we're actually thinking through the power of the Holy Spirit and asking him to clean our minds and our perspectives and our thoughts and our processes to be able to hear what Christ is saying and to actually respond in faith rather than through our cultural limitations. I hope that's encouraging and challenging um, for us all to remember to be asking these questions so that because that hermeneutic constantly changes. There's baselines that are really deep that are really hard to change, like the way your family raised you. Um, but the, the things that are constantly coming into our minds, like the news and social media, conversations with people, things that are practiced at church, etc., those are a little bit easier to change because they haven't been a part of our mind for so long. Um, so just ask God to start wherever he can, to start sweeping your mind and washing it and cleaning it and removing anything that's hindering the work of the Holy Spirit in the way you think and process. Um, because the scary reality that we could be reading the scripture and only hearing what we've been told to hear, been programmed to hear, rather than actually seeing what God is saying, just like these Jews were doing in this passage. I don't want to be that person who's trapped in any kind of cultural perspective. I want to be free to hear the Spirit in who he is and what he's doing and to recognize cultural sin as as cultural sin and not just accept behavior that everyone does around me as normal uh, because that sets up a real issue in the church when lost people are watching from a distance and they see these behaviors in the church that are same as behaviors everywhere else because it's all the same culture and there's no difference between those following Christ and those not then it's um, very hard to witness or evangelize or talk about a changed life talk about new life talk about God's spirit guiding and leading us when behaviors and patterns of life and attitudes and things we're passionate about are exactly the same as the lost world around us. Anyway, I hope it's, uh, if anyone has lasted this long, I've talked almost 40 minutes. I applaud you for staying with me <laughs> this long. Thank you for listening. I hope that God use it as a blessing. Have a great week. Bye.